And I decided to focus on heart failure because of the burden of this condition. So five million people in the United States have heart failure. It's actually the leading cause of hospitalization among Medicare recipients and the number one cause of readmission within 60 days of discharge. And the total cost of heart failure over $30 billion <laughs> per year. And many of us in the room who um, are clinically active understand the importance of uh, early readmissions and the pressure on health systems to reduce these. So this issue of heart failure and heart failure readmissions in particular is something that's um, on everyone's radar screen right now. Um, and developing strategies to reduce heart failure readmissions has really become a national priority. So that these are now publicly reported performance measures and there are financial penalties for 30-day readmissions. So telemonitoring is a promising strategy um, that can enable remote monitoring so that clinicians can intervene early when there's evidence of clinical deterioration. And the rationale for this is that many patients with heart failure may deteriorate over a period of days to even weeks before requiring hospitalization. And so if only we had some way to sort of monitor patient status, that might alert clinicians to early signs and symptoms of decompensation so that we could avert the need for hospitalization or even worse, a death before hospitalization can occur. So to get a better handle on this period of um, sort of subclinical deterioration before hospitalization or what's going on in that window um, that's oftentimes invisible to us as clinicians before patients come into the emergency room or to the hospital, we did a case control study. Um, I try to keep the microphone near me as I sort of turn around here, but just let me know if you can't hear me. So um, day zero is the day that our case patients, which are shown in the upper line there with the triangular hatch marks, the case these patients were hospitalized for heart failure on day zero, and we matched these cases to control patients based on weight and New York Heart Association, sex, um, and we had daily weights on these patients. So this is information on patients with heart failure who were weighing themselves on a daily basis. This came from a telemonitoring company. So at the beginning of this study, 45 days, you see all the way uh, to the far left there, 45 days prior to the time of heart failure hospitalization, the weights on these patients were very well matched. And then a few days before the heart failure hospitalization happened in the case patients, you see that the weights start to diverge and that the case patients started to put on weight somewhere between five and seven days before hospitalization occurred. And so that kind of lended some credence to this idea that there was a time period, a window, where if only we knew about this weight change and perhaps some other symptoms that patients may be experiencing, that perhaps the physicians could uh, implement interventions to avert that outcome of hospitalization. So in fact, there have been um, a few studies to look at this question, you know, can providing physicians with information about patients' clinical status avert hospitalization? In fact, there was a recent meta-analysis that came out last summer by the Cochrane Group looking at telephone support and telemonitoring programs for patients with heart failure. And the authors of this review concluded that in fact, uh, telemonitoring for patients with heart failure is effective. Um, the last row there shows you the effect for all-cause mortality so it was effective in reducing all-cause mortality with a hazard ratio of 0.66 and all-cause hospitalization. The authors went on to um, make comments about how patients found this technology to be uh, very acceptable and adapted to use of this technology easily. But when we went through and started to look at some of the individual studies that were included in this meta-analysis, we started to understand that there were a number of limitations so that many of these studies were small. Most, the vast majority of the 25 studies included in this meta-analysis had fewer than 250 subjects. In fact, over half of them had fewer than 100. Almost all of them were conducted at a single site and oftentimes the investigators were testing the effectiveness of what we call homegrown interventions. So the investigators developed their own telemonitoring intervention and then were the same people who were testing the effectiveness which of course might lead to some bias. Um, there are many um, strategies to implement telemonitoring. This is really um, a, a promising approach and sort of despite the limitations of the evidence base telemonitoring is something which is really taken off. It's uh, really captured quite a market share. It's being used in a number of managed care organizations um, and also in the VA as well. 
So to kind of assess this, um, this question and really get a better handle on, you know, can telemonitoring really improve outcomes, we conducted this clinical trial. And our primary hypothesis was that telemonitoring will reduce the combined outcome of all-cause readmission and death over six months. So to be eligible for the study, patients had to be hospitalized for heart failure in the past 30 days. And we selected patients who were recently hospitalized because that's a particularly vulnerable group. So you know, once patients are hospitalized for heart failure, they have about a 50% chance based on recent Medicare data for either being rehospitalized or dying within the next six to 12 months. So that's a very, very high event rate. And we thought that we would have a, a, an opportunity to, to do some good there. Patients had to be at least 18 years of age, able to speak English or Spanish, provide informed consent, and they had to have access to a reliable telephone line, not necessarily a landline. It could be a cell phone, it could be a neighbor's phone, but they had to be able to make these phone calls every day. So we established a recruitment network of cardiology practices across the country with particular attention to uh, geographic diversity, but also racial and socioeconomic diversity. So these were all cardiology um, outpatient practices. Um, and these practices were responsible for screening and enrolling their own patients into the study. So these are the cardiologists who are responsible for taking care of the patients. These aren't you know, third parties, um, but these are the patients' doctors. They had to uh, review and manage the information that was coming in from the telemonitoring system on a daily basis. And in this way, the intervention was really firmly embedded in real world clinical practice. So this trial was really sort of a strategy trial, testing a strategy of providing physicians with more information about their patients. Um, and so the, uh, I showed you that there were many different uh, companies and um, devices to implement telemonitoring. The one that we selected was developed by a company, Ferros Innovations. Their product is called Telassurance. And we selected that not because of any uh, financial incentives or any ties to that company. In fact, we paid for use of that uh, telemonitoring uh, uh, package. But because it's a device-free system and it doesn't require any reading by patients. All of the questions are just uh, heard over the phone. And so that removes any barriers that patients might have around literacy um, or vision. So all of our sites received support and training from the Yale Coordinating Center. We went out and visited each of these practice sites at the time that they came onto the study. And we, um, several times a year, had you know, conference calls where all of the site coordinators participated, talked about how it was that they were identifying patients, enrolling patients, how were they screening, any challenges that they had in managing the data. We paid um, the sites uh, slightly more for telemonitoring given the increased time burden of managing that information. So the telemonitoring intervention, again, this consisted of daily toll-free calls to an interactive voice response system for six months. Patients heard questions about their general health, about heart failure symptoms, and about body weight. And every 30 days, they also uh, rotated in two questions about depressive symptoms from the PHQ-2. So there were predetermined responses that triggered variances to flag clinicians' attention. So, you know, for the question of, are you having more shortness of breath in the last day, if a patient answered yes, that would trigger what we called a variance. So these variances are things that might signal to the clinician that the patient was getting into trouble. So I've listed out the specific questions here. Um, and just to read through these quickly to give you a sense of the real content of this. So compared with yesterday, would you say that you're feeling better, the same, worse, or much worse? Have you felt more short of breath in the last day? Have you noticed more swelling in the last day? Did you wake up short of breath last night? Did you sleep in a chair with more pillows last night? Have you had any dizziness in the last day? And then the, the depressive symptoms questions are listed there. Those were rotated in every 30 days, as I said. And then finally, patients entered their weight using a telephone keypad. And patients did have to have a touchtone telephone. We were surprised at how many patients actually still had the old rotary phones. Um, but we were able to provide those to patients who needed them as well. So clinicians' role in this was that they had to review the telemonitoring data every business day. So this meant Monday through Friday. We weren't expecting physicians to review this data on weekends or on holidays. You know, basically this was sort of part of their office practice. Our protocol required that the clinicians contact participants whose data indicated worsening clinical status. So those are the variances that I mentioned earlier. And they actually had to document their responses right in the telemonitoring website. And I'll show you a screenshot of what that looked like in a minute. 
So uh, typically this review of the telemonitoring data was done by nurses who um, typically manage this data independently. Um, they could obtain physician input if they needed, depending on what it was that was going on with the patient, sort of the severity and the patient, um, individual clinical circumstances. But typically these were pretty high functioning mid-level practitioners who um, oftentimes had protocols for diuretics and this sort of thing according to amount of weight gain or other symptoms that were going on. So this is a screenshot from the Pharos website. Um, and you can see this is basically what it would look like when the site coordinator or the nurse reviewing the telemonitoring data would log in in the morning. Um, so they would see a list of their patients at the top who had variances. So we tried to sort of organize it in a way that would be efficient for them to review. Um, they listed exactly what the variance was triggered by in the next column. And then the site coordinator had to go in and sort of um, enter in information about what they did and then um, also write a free text note, so similar to what you would expect um, to happen in an office around um, management of any other sort of clinical situation. So we had a number of strategies to promote adherence to our protocol. So for patients, they were told that their information would be reviewed by the clinicians who were responsible for managing their heart failure. So they knew that this is to help your doctors keep you out of the hospital. And remember, these are all patients who were recently hospitalized for heart failure. And so our hope was that they would be highly incentivized or high, highly motivated to use this system to sort of be even more connected with their doctor and to help their doctor take the best possible care of them. And if the patients didn't use the system for two consecutive days, then they received a system-generated reminder call, just an automated call from the telemonitoring system. Um, after that, if they still didn't use the system, then they got contacted by staff, by a live person from the telemonitoring company to encourage participation. And these staff members were typically trained as uh, social workers who um, were very well versed in behavioral change and could address the barriers and challenges that patients might have been experiencing that might have uh, prevented them from calling. So we had a number of strategies as well to promote adherence uh, to the protocol for our clinicians. Of course, remember these are busy, you know, cardiology practices who already have a very full caseload, and now they're using this telemonitoring sort of on top of everything else. Um, so every two to three weeks, the staff from the coordinating center reviewed their responses to these variances, and we contacted sites if there was no documentation of how the variance was managed in order to ensure that they were looking at the information. Um, and you know, typically it was a matter, if there was no documentation on the website, typically it was a matter of, you know, the nurse told us, yes, yes, we saw that, but we sort of just didn't get into the system yet to document it. Um, but we sort of kept a close eye on that every couple of weeks to make sure that the information was being looked at and was being acted upon. So to give you a sense of the kinds of things that clinicians were documenting in the website, I just provided a couple of examples here. Um, so this is a nurse who contacted a patient, and um, her note says that the patient stated he had been eating smoked turkey sandwiches along with other high salt foods, encouraged to watch dietary intake, patient denies any shortness of breath or dyspnea, patient will call with any change in symptoms. So the baseline characteristics of our two groups are shown here. So we enroll just over um, 1,640 patients. We had 826 who were randomized to telemonitoring and 827 who were randomized to usual care. Um, so these are all uh, their characteristics at baseline. The two groups were very well matched. There were no statistically significant differences. Our median age was 61, which is slightly younger than the average uh, patient with heart failure. Um, and it may say something about the kind kinds of patients who are willing to use these sorts of technologies. 44% um, were female. We had good minority representation. You know, NIH requires us to have at least 25% minorities. Most of our minorities were black race. We had close to 40%. Uh, good socioeconomic diversity as well. A quarter had less than a high school education. Almost 30% had an annual income of less than 10,000. And, uh, you know, these were sick patients. I've shown you the most prevalent uh, comorbid diseases here, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and coronary artery disease that were present in almost half of the participants. You know, so these aren't the sort of clean, perfect, heart failure only patients that we oftentimes see in um, clinical trials of patients with heart failure. And the two groups were um, very similar, very well matched also in terms of their use of medications, uh, the heart failure medications that we would expect patients to be on, so ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, diuretics, digoxin. 
So, um, you know, in any uh, trial, it's important to understand kind of how much of the dose was delivered. And so we looked carefully at our adherence in many different ways and, and thought a lot about how best to define adherence. And that was really a challenging question for us. So I should say 86% of patients who were randomized to telemonitoring made at least one phone call. Um, and again, you know, how one defines adherence to an intervention like this isn't totally clear. Um, you know, people oftentimes will talk about sort of the crude rate while well, 70% of the calls were made over the six month period. We really felt that it was important to um, give a measure that would give a better sense of what was happening on a weekly basis since we understand that heart failure status may change from week to week, even day to day. And so we defined it as making at least three calls per week, somewhere around half the calls per week. And not surprisingly, our adherence was highest at the beginning of the study. So in the first week, 90% of patients uh, met good adherence. And by the final week, over 55% were adherent. So our primary endpoint, all-cause readmission or death occurred exactly equally in the two groups, 52%. We had a number of secondary endpoints as well, all-cause readmission, death, and heart failure readmission also occurred exactly equally in the two groups. 47% uh, experienced all-cause readmission in usual care, 49% telemonitoring, and 11% experienced death in the two groups. We included a number of secondary endpoints. I'll just sort of scroll through these quickly. I'm reaching the end of my time here with you, but we looked at number of hospital days, number of readmission. We looked at time to event, and we didn't see any differences in any of these secondary endpoints. And I'll just wrap up by telling you we looked at a number of subgroup analyses as well to see, well, you know, perhaps it's not an effective intervention if you sort of put it out there in the universe of heart failure patients, but maybe there's a subgroup, and we couldn't find anything. We looked at age, sex, race, ejection fraction, New York heart, and we couldn't find anything. We looked at a number of site characteristics as well, which I can elaborate on. So we published this data, and I can just tell you very, very quickly, one of the um, criticisms that has come up um, is that we should have used a more sophisticated form of uh, monitoring technology, that just looking at symptoms and asking patients to weigh themselves is sort of, sort of outmoded, and we should have looked at more physiologic parameters. We should have had 24-7 manning of this data by cardiologists ready to um, respond and, you know, sort of uh, fortuitously, this is exactly the study that was published several months after ours by a German group. They enrolled over 700 patients with heart failure. They had patients who were not just answering questions and weighing themselves, but had EKG strips coming in on a daily basis. They were checking blood pressure, digital transmission of uh, body weights, and their uh, call centers were manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week by cardiologists who were wearing beepers. And can you imagine getting paged by someone's weight? So they were at the ready, and you know, these, this was a group of patients who were very good about following directions. They had better adherence rates than ours, and it was a negative study also. Um, so uh, I'll wrap up with that. So um, in conclusion, among patients recently hospitalized for heart failure, telemonitoring didn't improve outcomes, and our results indicate the importance of a thorough and independent evaluation of disease management strategies before widespread adoption.